Yes. So I think let's start. Let people join in if they wish to, because and I'm so sorry for so low turnout. I don't know why, but it's been a very low turnout today. Doesn't matter. I I I really don't have any problems <laughs> with lower turnouts. Yeah. So uh, today we're going to talk about how to give presentation, how to present your business idea, how to put it across to people whom whom you're going to pitch it across. Today we're going to even talk about how do you go ahead and what is the right time that you want to raise fund for your organization, and how to connect with these people who can come and invest into your company. And and for this, there is no better person than Hari sir. Uh, I think I, I have received a great amount of guidance from him on my project, and I'm still working on the guidance. And I still don't know how to reply it back to him. But yes, I'm still working on it, and uh, you know, reviewing everything that I've had, and probably go back to him and find out what it is going to be. So guys, never be scared of you know getting your plans reviewed. Uh, you know, having an access over somebody who's been there, done that. and can give you a practical knowledge and to you know analyze your uh, business ventures it's very very important to get a very uh, practical view of what is happening in the world you know there are certain things which looks good on the projection sheets and everything but there are certain things which has to work on practicalities ultimately the physicality of this is what is going to matter so for that we have somebody uh, named hari bala subramaniam sir he's been very very active in this uh, field of mentoring entrepreneurs and not now i think i've been here for 3 years now and he's always been as one of the part of our uh, women pitch mentoring uh, uh, mentor and as well as a person who's also mentoring in our mentoring clinic as well so you know just go out all out ask all questions that you have today and for that i i will just take give him the space and not Occupy too much of my uh, his space and share anything more. So, sir, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Rachna. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. I'll make this very interesting for all of you, and you will definitely be able to take a lot of uh, you know good inputs because I'm very passionate about entrepreneurship, and I. i've been an entrepreneur myself and now i help entrepreneurs from all over so uh, let me uh, i I'm, i'm going to share my screen normally i don't do presentations i speak spontaneously but uh, there are a few things which i think uh, you know will flow well if i can just take you through my agenda okay so i'll share my screen neha can i share my screen yes sir you can of course okay so is it visible yes sir it is visible okay so uh, the first statement i'm going to make is you know i am a startup guy which means i i work typically with startups that does not mean that i don't understand large businesses but my focus is on startups which means companies so first thing is let's understand what's a startup so you know since we have a smaller group i don't have any problems in doing an interactive session any of you want to chip in stop me ask me a question or want to share what you think is a startup you know we can we can do it that way as well so what's what's a startup all of us talk about startups right so what's a startup anyone um, sonika um, indu shanu आपको अंग्रेजी में नहीं बोलना है हिंदी में भी बोल सकते हैं कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं व्हाट्स स्टार्टअप ओके सिंस नॉन ऑफ यूर आंसरिंग आई जस्ट वॉम इट अप आई से स्टार्टअप इज अ बिजनेस एस्टैब्लिशमेंट और अ ह्यूमन एस्टैब्लिशमेंट व्हिच हैज टू सर्वाइव इन द मोस्ट extreme uncertainties it has to operate in an environment of extreme uncertainties nothing is certain for a startup you don't know where the money is going to come from you don't know where the customer is going to come from you don't know what product you are going to make you don't know how to bake the product right a startup works under extreme uncertainties that's what is defined as a startup is it making sense does anybody are you able to relate to this fact that you are trying to do something which you don't know at all you don't have the money you don't have the people you don't have uh, you know customers but still you want to do something right everything is uncertain so a startup means you live in an age of uncertainty every single moment is uncertain for you that's what is a startup 
And what is about startups, you know, who are working is startups are all about discovering business models. So if, if for example, if there is a, um, let's say a corner shop, a shop which is run, you know, which just sells provisions and other things. So that's a business model. So you're not discovering anything. You're just copying or you're just using a business model, which everybody knows, right? Which means people come to your shop. You've got all the daily provisions in that shop. People buy and you make a small margin. And if your number of customers are high and if they start buying more, then you start making profits. Otherwise, what you do is whatever is your cost, you just recover that, right? So startups are all about discovering business models. So if you discover a business model and you're able to scale that business model, that's when you have arrived, right? But typically what happens is most people try to copy somebody else and try to do something. India is a very big market. So here it's not that only one company can survive. We can have multiple companies which can do the same thing and can do it well and earn money and build a large organization. So the most important thing for a startup when it's at the ideation stage is the team. So you are a founder, you want to build a startup, right? So you need to have a vision. So what is your vision? The first question which any startup should ask is, what is the startup founder's vision? I would again request all of you to be, you know, participate in this discussion because it's not a one, you know, it's not a dialogue. It's not a monologue. It has to be a dialogue or a multi-log where all of you can contribute and we can sort out Many of your confusions or you can get clarity on a few, a few topics and subjects. So the most important person when a startup starts is the founder and the founder's vision. So how many of you are founders? You know, all of you, please unmute and share if you can. It will be useful. You know, it will be helpful if all of us can participate. So how many of you are founders? Okay, Rachna is one. Shanu? Hindu, Sonika, what about you? Yeah, basically, I am trading, if you call that as the founder, I'm the, I mean, hand, uh, I'm single-handedly, I'm handling everything. No, you, you, was, you said what you are trading. Yeah, I mean, I'm procuring from somewhere and then selling it. I mean, yeah, it's okay, so you're a one-person team. Yeah, yeah. You are a one-person team, right? Okay, yeah. so you have a vision, you know, you know why you are doing it. It's it's just not that you're doing it to make money, but you're doing it for some other reason, or it's just for making money. We don't know that yet, but I'm assuming that you have a vision, a vision to take your company to a particular level. It's, it's just not a time pass type of an activity. Yeah, yeah. Very okay, what about Hindu and... Anybody else would like to participate in this discussion? You know, because if you participate, we'll get a lot together. Yeah. So I can share. Uh, so the company that I started was Ignite Hangs. It was started with the intent of letting people have their, uh, you know, it was, it was more into letting people uh, see themselves first more and put themselves uh, more first than anybody over there. And it was all into self-development and personality development. So the vision I had was to uh, be enlightened inside and then you can see the light outside. So this was okay. my vision. Okay. So it was more of an internal journey for everybody to you know, really understand what they like, what they don't like, what are their priorities, what they want to do with their life. Okay. That's very good. At least you, you know, that's a vision to pursue. Anybody else would like to join? Indu, Sonika, please don't be shy. You know, just uh, open up. Whatever it is, you know, it'll, you will be participating and you will be contributing. Because this is actually a group and teamwork. So it's just not uh, a monologue from my side. Anyway, so startups are all about discovering business models. So you, you need to have a team and the team has to have a vision. So when we say vision, you know, it means that we need to have a direction and we need to go in that direction. The direction itself may be wrong initially. So we make mistakes and we learn and we change the course of our startup. And the other important aspect is it's not just about a one person company. So as you start growing, as you start seeing more and more transactions or customers or you know problems that you want to solve, you will start getting more and more people inside the startup. When I say more and more, it doesn't mean hundreds and thousands, at least the core team members who are going to decide what is the problem and what is the solution, you need to build them that because one person has got a lot of limitations. So one person is very strong in terms of being able to change things. When you want to really, uh, solve a complex problem, you really need people with multiple specializations. 
So typically the founder is important and the team is very important in any startup. And founder and the team go work together to discover their business model, okay? So it's very important for a founder to start empowering his teams. When I say empowering, it means that the team should have liberty to explain, solve, talk, and share what they think about a particular problem. It's not that, you know, it's not like a typical, uh, you know, company where the boss is always right. You know, in a startup, what happens is all team members have to contribute and share what they think about the current solution that they are building to solve a problem. So, and always, you know, it's because you're discovering a business model, you know, good teams are always learning. There is nothing called as you've learned everything. Every day, every moment we are learning something or the other, which again becomes very handy for us to, uh, you know, solve problems or find what is the solution to a problem. So this is why uh, the culture which a startup builds is very important because if you have a very good culture in terms of your work environment, every single uh, team member who joins you, you know, feels very comfortable and starts giving him uh, giving more than what is expected out of him, which means they are free and they are able to express what they think about a particular problem or about a particular situation and they are able to contribute. It's just not that the boss is saying something and everybody is just doing it. So if you take an example of, you know, thousands of startups, you will see that only maybe hundreds have succeeded. 999, uh, you know, typically if you see 900s have failed and only 100 have succeeded, which means out of 10 startups, typically only one would succeed and nine would fail. Does that mean that, you know, these nine who have failed are absolutely gone? No. So they have actually learned and they are now ready to do the next startup that they are start. They, they want to start now. So failures are a very, very big pillars of success, you know, especially in the startup world we have seen. The biggest uh, or the most successful entrepreneurs have all failed at some point of time. So failure and successes are part of the same coin. So you have to know how to respect both of them. And failed entrepreneurs are definitely respected by people who really understand the startup culture and the startup world. There is, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, discussion and debate and research which went on in the US to understand what is the reason why a startup is succeeding and why should a startup fail, right? So, and after spending a lot of money, if you fail, uh, you know, uh, you lose a lot of time and money. So there were many theories in terms of how can we do a startup at the least important, least possible time and at the least possible cost. That is when the concept of a lean startup you know, came up and everybody started, you know, following the lean startup model or the lean startup technique to understand how they should build their startup. So the first thing that is important for a lean startup is leap of faith assumptions. So startups are all about discovering business models. So the, if you're trying to solve a problem, you will make some assumptions. You will think, for example, uh, let us say that we think that there is a great market for, um, you know, tailoring for women, right? We think that there is a great market for, you know, customized tailoring for women. So we are, we want to, this is an assumption that all women like custom built, uh, you know, clothes, and we are going to create a service where, you know, tailors can be on demand and customers would be willing to pay more if you have somebody coming to the house and taking your measurements and stitching that cloth and giving it back to you. So if this is an assumption, what is required is, you have to have such assumptions, which is called leap of faith assumptions. And these assumptions are what are tested. So if the assumptions that you are making are tested and you get the right type of results, you get a signal that, okay, this assumption is working because eight out of 10 people to whom I'm talking, all of them are saying, yes, you know, we need custom made clothes. And you, if you can send a tailor home, we don't mind paying extra because we don't have to go out and you know it's very convenient. You can come for a trial and then you can deliver the clothes. So if eight out of 10 women say that, yes, we, we are willing to pay you for this and it's a great service, that's when you know that this assumption is probably going to work. So similarly, you can take uh, you know two, three assumptions. Then you say that, okay, there are at least one lakh women in Calcutta who all would want tailoring services and they will be paying at least uh, 200 or 300 rupees for you know, getting a, a, any of their clothes stitched. Let's say on an average, you know, for a blouse to be stitched, they would pay 100 rupees or 200 rupees. So we know that one lakh women uh, could be our target audience and each one is going to pay 100 rupees and they would make at least five or six, you know, such clothes every year. So we can look at a five or a six crore market. You know, that's an assumption. So 
it's all about testing whether your assumptions are right and it's the right place. So if you know that there are one lakh women who all want to, you know, stitch their blouses or kurtas or whatever it is, and then even if you are able to get 1,000 of them, all of them paying 5,000 rupees each, you have actually arrived in the sense you have 1,000 customers paying you 5,000 rupees, right? That could be the starting point of a great business. So any business which starts, starts with a leap of faith assumption. The leap of faith assumption is tested with a minimum viable product. For example, in the same example if I'm, that I told you, your assumption is women want tailored clothes and they don't mind spending some money to get a tailor home who can do the measurements. If this is the assumptions, what you can do is you can just do a minimum viable product, which means it's an experiment. You become like a scientist. A scientist typically does experiments. Most of these experiments fail. Only if, and, but what the scientist gets is a lot of data. From the data, he changes the experiment and goes on experimenting again and again until unless he finds the right solution to a particular problem. So in this case, let's say you pick up 100 names and you say that I'm going to speak to these 100 women and ask them how much they will pay if we send a tailor home. If we have an app through which they can just click a button or if we have a phone number where they can call and within one hour, a tailor lands up at your house to do your measurements and we will deliver it in 24 hours, right? How many women say, yes, we are willing to take this service or pay for this service? So you speak to 100 women and note down all their feedback and then you start analyzing to understand, oh, is this going to work? You know, if, if out of 180 women say that, no, 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 we don't want to pay, we like ready-made clothes, right? Then you know that, okay, probably this is not the segment that you want to uh, uh, you know, address. When I say segment, women are of various types, right? So there are women who are self-employed, there are women who are going to office, there are women who are sitting at home, all types of women are there and at age, various age groups also women are there. So which age group is most, uh, you know, interesting for us because they want this service. So you have to, again, when you're doing, um, you know, this leap of faith assumptions, you have to, and you are saying that uh, girls, Below 25 are our customers. In that case, you start looking for them and see what are their aspirations, whether you're actually solving the problems for uh, them. Or you can say that anybody who's getting married is going to be our customer. So we look at, uh, you know, to be married individuals as our customers, because when people get married, they typically don't mind spending more money. And we want to be there, you know, taking as much money as possible from people who want to get married. So these are all assumptions. And based on these assumptions, you have to do uh, experiments. When I say experiments, you have to collect data. And based on this data, you decide whether your service will work or not. So at this point of time, you have not hired a single person. You are a one-person company at that time. So the validation because you want to be convinced that you're going in the right direction okay so the lean startup typically tells you that you know you must do experiments and you must find uh, you know whatever are the learnings we call that as validated learning of these experiments and once we validate these experiments or once we get these learnings we change our experiment to incorporate those learnings and again go and build the model for example in the first example that i told you you went after women who are let's say 45 plus now, when you talk to 45 plus women, many of them are out of shape, right? So, you know, they, they want custom clothes. At the same time, if you've done the experiments with, uh, you know, women over 21, but below 30, most of them are in shape and they don't want custom clothes. They, they can go to a Zara, they can go to Marks and Spencer's and pick up or any other shop and pick up and it fits them. So you, you now decide that, okay, the assumption is 45 plus women or women who are out of shape, they are our customers. So if this is the assumption and there is some data to prove that, yes, this is coming to be right, then you go back and again test with women who are 45 plus and find out how many of them want to buy your product if you have a tailoring service on demand. Now here you say that, okay, 80% of women are interested in, uh, you know, in getting a tailor on demand, you know, and we can deliver the clothes in, let's say 48 hours or 24 hours. In this particular case, again, you see that there are some women who do not, who wear saris and who want only blouses, but they're not willing to pay 200 rupees for the blouse. So you may get across a lot of such data and then you decide, okay, what is the best thing to take an order for? Is it a salwar or is it a sari or is it a dress or is it a you know, blouse? So you can decide all these things by actually talking to your target customers. So 
what you did was you did an experiment based on the data that you got from the experiment. You changed your experiment and then again tested the same experiment with the target customers that you think are your best customers. And then again, with that feedback, you decide that, okay, you know, we will stitch salwar kameez and or the salwar suits and we will deliver it in 24 hours. So that's your business. That becomes what is your vision. So we are the people who who give you ready made, uh, you know, ready to wear salwar, which are you know customized, and we deliver it in twenty four hours. So that that can be your USP, and that you with that USP you start, you know, one on one side you start aggregating tailors, and on the other side you start looking at customers, and that's when your actual business can start functioning. Now. Um, you know, you see that by doing this, you are not getting many orders. You know, you started doing this, you thought that it's going to be a great business. And in one month's time, you saw that every day you're just getting one order. You know, the number of orders are not increasing. The same customers are not coming back, right? So at that time, you, you decide, you know, what is wrong with this uh, model? You can look at thinking that, oh my God, the tailors are bad. You know, the tailors do not have style because of which customers are not, you know, coming back. So you can look at, what is wrong with your model and you can see if there are any changes to be made and you can make those changes and again go back to customers and see by this time you have really not spent a lot of money right you have not raised funding because you're just trying to discover a business model which is going to work now what has happened is suddenly you see that you know uh, th there is a particular area from where a lot of orders are coming and then you you see that oh my god i need more and more people to actually stitch i need more and more people to go and deliver uh, so what should I do about that? That's when you think that, yes, this model is going to work and now I need to scale. So if there are one lakh women and each one places at least two to three orders in a year, you are looking at three lakh orders. So is that possible? Yes, it is possible. That is when you will look at, okay, how can I scale? How can I bring in more people? How can I bring in more funding? Because, you know, when if you've got uh, 100 people who are all measuring and, uh, you know, there are 200 tailors who are all stitching and then you have people who are delivering, uh, you know, you really need a team and then you need to see how you can raise funding. So is this is this making sense in terms of what I'm saying? Yes, I'm asking yes. a question. Yes. yes. Yeah. So basically, the idea is you have to continuously experiment and discover your business model. And once you discover your business model, that is when you're ready to scale. So in order to, uh, you know, these are all very theoretical discussions, but in order, there are many tools by which you can actually uh, look at how you should define your business. So one of this is a business model canvas. I think you, you must have done a business model canvas type of a program. I'll just take you quickly through this. So, uh, basically, what we are saying is every business has got many components. So, in, in fact, I would say a business has got nine components. First is the customer. So, we all exist because of customers. So, for who are you creating value? In our example, you know, we are creating value for women because we are doing tailoring for women. But that is not good enough. Women can be from, you know, let's say seven years to maybe 100 years, right? So, then you have to, again, understand who is your most important customer. Then you say that, okay, our... Our customers are women who are out of shape and who are above 45. That could be your customer segment. That's your main customer segment. It's not that women are women at 21 who are out of shape cannot be your customer, but you're targeting women who are 45 and out of shape as your customers. You define that as your customer segment. So you can have multiple customer segments. The next thing is, what does each, each of your customer, uh, you know, every customer segment, we typically have channels. For example, how would you reach to your customer? How would you reach to women who are 45 plus? That's a question because you need a large number of customers. So how will you reach to them? Individually, if you have to reach, you have to use uh, you know, social media, you have to use uh, mass communication media and other things. But is there a way by which uh, on a low cost basis, you can reach out to let's say 100 women who are 45 plus? Yes, maybe you, know, you can look at looking, you know, getting introduced to some uh, social women who run let's say parties for kitty parties or something like that for women who are 45, right? You, you look at who are all the people who are active in the kitty circle, you go to them and you tell them that this is what you want to do and you need their help in, in getting introduced to women who are 45 plus. So this customer segment, you have to find out how you can reach them. So if you can understand how your customer segment can be reached, then you can look at what should be your relationship with them. How do you 
relate to these customers or uh, for example if if there is a newspaper a newspaper typically uh, wants advertisers to uh, you know for their money right but advertisers come only when you have consumers if you have people consuming news that's when advertisers come so the newspapers customers are actually advertisers but they need consumers to actually consume the news that they are printing or publishing right so the more the consumers the more are the opportunities for their customers to advertise and that's how they make money right so the relationship is you have to build relationship with corporates you have to build, build relationship with brands and also you have to ensure that every your newspaper or whatever you are trying to sell you know it go, goes and reaches the hands of the consumer the next thing you need to understand is whenever you want to um, reach out to customers you have to do activities for example it could be talking it could be organizing events it could be organizing exhibitions it could be organizing workshops so many things are there by which you can actually do activities and get your customers engaged but why should a customer come to you the customer will come to you only if you have a value proposition when i say value proposition you know people buy either for pleasure or for pain now in the case of a tailoring example people have a pain in one way that you know the ready made clothes do not fit them but they also have a pleasure of having uh, you know uh, something custom made for their body right and that really gives them confidence you know because everybody gets confidence you know when when you wear the right clothes so you want to actually um, you know solve you you want to have the pleasure of having something which you call as your own it's not bought from any shop like a fab india or a zara or whatever it is so you 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 say that these are all designer wear which you are um, you 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 are owning right so there cannot be many pieces like what you are owning so it gives you a sense of pride it gives you ego satisfaction and you feel a pleasure when you wear some designer wear which is made custom made for you so that's a value proposition that you're talking here and once you have the value proposition and the customers identified that's when you require resources resources in this case could be tailors it could be you know uh, many other types of activities you know money is a resource internet is a resource the phone is a resource so like this you may have number of resources which are required for you to engage in activities by which you can communicate your value proposition to customer yeah. segments and then customers right and then you may have partners for this you know you may you know typically if you see that there are many people who partner with organizations for example newspapers will partner with advertising agencies or with some brands and they will drive their uh, you know agenda so partnership is very important so you may also have partners who will help for example there could be um, a, a brand which can give you very good uh, you know textiles or very good fabric right so you can partner with that brand and say that okay these are all a special um, uh, material which you can get because we have partnered with them and the partner also partners with you because he knows that if you have access to 1 lakh customers who are all going to buy fabric you know they are, they are going to get a large order from you right so these are all the partnerships that you need to establish in any business right in most businesses you will have to work with partners for example if you are um if even if you are doing google advertising google will become your partner because you have to use them in order to get customers so in order to do all these things there are costs so you know what are your costs you have a cost of running your establishment you have a cost of keeping some people uh, you know on the payroll you have cost of advertising you have cost of delivery you have cost of switching so there are many many costs so you need to identify all these costs so that you can actually um you know finance all these activities because the costs are coming all the time the next thing is you know because of the costs and because of the value proposition because of the activities the customer is exchanging money for what you are delivering that is when you have revenue streams so <clears throat> so cost when revenue streams exceed cost that's when you start looking at profits so the total revenues that you are making out of your business that has to exceed the cost that you are incurring in driving the business that is when you make make a profit so the business model is typically to uh, come to a stage where your overall revenues are much higher than the cost that you are incurring and that is what makes a business now in order to get to this stage where your revenues are higher than a cost you know it takes time and it takes a lot of uh, you know activities to be done where you don't earn money that is what we call as a burn so you have to get financed for this burn you know it's not that every business starts making profit from day one businesses make profit only when they reach a particular scale so the startup is all about discovering all these things 
and ensuring that the revenues that you collect are higher than the cost that you incur. And the earlier you get there, you know, the better it is for you. And the larger revenue stream that you're able to get, you know, that's when, you know, investors are interested because investors want to multiply their money. So they will support you when you don't have any uh, revenues. And then when you start having revenues, the values will increase and the investors have a much higher exit or a much higher value for what they have given to you. And you have given them shares or, you know, some other instruments. So is this, is this clear in terms of why a startup is all about discovering business models? So once you discover your business model, the business model should have more revenues than costs. That's when your business model is discovered. Okay. So I'll stop this. I'll go back to the earlier screen. Okay. So this is what is the business model, uh, you know, business canvas and value proposition. Okay, I have I have to take the value proposition. That's very important. Just one second, please. Okay. Okay. See, the most important thing for a startup is, you know, startups exist because of the customers. We all exist because of customer. Every business exists because of its customer. So in this particular case, you know, what is the value proposition? Customers have gain, customers can have pain, and customers have routine jobs. For example, in your house, you would have, you know, a, a maid coming in and doing a lot of routine work. And you don't mind paying her for that because your time is more precious. So you want to pay somebody to do the routine jobs so that you can get more value for your time. So that is one of the reasons why customers buy because they want to get rid of their routine jobs. The other reason why customers buy is because of gain or pain. When I say gain or pain, it primarily means that you buy for pleasure or for as a painkiller. You have a pain and you want a painkiller. So these are the two reasons why customers will buy from you, which is a buying is an emotional decision. And customers typically would buy if there is a pain, they also buy when there is a gain and they also buy when there are routine jobs, which they want to others to do it and they want to uh, save their time. Now, the value proposition or what actually any startup or any business is selling is, it is either selling, addressing all these problems. So if you have a pain, you know, the startup is giving you a painkiller because of which you go to that startup or go to that business. If you want gain, they have got something like a grain creator. You know, they can create gains for you because of which you go to them. And the other thing is you deliver routine jobs. That's why, you know, the startup comes to you and you deliver it to them. They give you money and you deliver the job. So this is what is a, what we call as a value proposition canvas. Every business should address this, which means you have to understand what are the customer's gains, pains and routine jobs. There, there could be only pain. There can be no jobs or, uh, you know, no gain or routine jobs. So customers have a pain and you are supplying a painkiller to them because of which they are giving you money. So when people are in pain, they don't mind spending any type of money to get rid of their pain. That is one of the good business models where if you have a painkiller, customers start buying from you. And those customers who are pain are the, your best customers. Is it clear? Yes. Yes. What happens when we have, so we are designing a product to innovative. What happens in that space? Yeah, when you're, see, designing a product the first question you should ask is for who are you designing this product mm -hmm. what problem are you solving right and then you know when you take the product which is like it's not a full product but it's a product with minimum features you take it to a customer and you ask the customer hey this is a customer this is the product that we have built does it help you is it suiting you right so when, when, when people ask these type of questions, that is when the real story comes out in terms of whether the product is actually fit for the customer. That's what we call as a product market fit. When, you, when a product actually is solving a problem, then what happens is you start getting calls for, from people or from customers saying, hey, I heard you are doing this. Can you help me? Right. So product market mm -hmm. fit is one of the most important uh, you know, stages of a startup development where you are able to understand that you're doing something in the right direction. You're trying to solve a problem and that problem you're solving and now customers are recognizing that you're solving a problem. So it's very important, uh, you know, in the product development cycle to understand, you know, first, 
whether you have product market fit. And once your product is there and you are continuously improving it, that's when you will see that the product goes through a number of versions because customers' requirement keep changing. Customers start using a product in much different ways than what you thought that they are going to use it. So there are many, for example, uh, one of the best uh, innovations of India is the missed call. You know, earlier when there were charges for making a phone call, people would just give a missed call and say that I've come. So for a zero cost, they are able to communicate. And that became like, you know, a, a big practice when mobile phone charges were very high. So, you know, mm -hmm. when somebody goes to pick up somebody else says that, okay, when I come down, I'll give you a missed call. You know, that's the understanding. So the missed call comes, this person comes down. So they don't even waste, uh, you know, one paise for that call, right? So these are some of the things that, uh, you know, when you do products, you start realizing that customers use a product in much different ways than what it was designed for. Okay. Okay. So uh, I use a technique which is very popular in Silicon Valley and with large companies, which is called as OKR. So whenever you are working, for example, even in your day-to-day -day life, you know, we all have 24 hours of time and uh, this goes on, you know, automatically. You cannot stop time, right? But if you want to achieve something, right, how can you ensure that you are able to make progress on a daily basis and you are able to get there? Right. So that is why OKRs, which means objectives and key results are very important. For example, let's say your objective is you want to lose weight. Now you say that, OK, in the next 90 days, I want to lose weight. I want to lose five kilos at least. Now, if that is your objective, then you cannot lose five kilos in one day. You have to lose weight slowly. Right. So what you start doing is you start keeping uh, you know, a few things which you can measure on a daily basis and you can track that. So it can be daily basis, weekly basis. So mm -hmm. you say that, okay, I will do 10 kilometers of walking every day. That could be one of the metrics, which means every day you tick off whether you've done 10 kilometers of walking or not. Just walking is not good enough. You have to observe what you're eating. So you will say that, okay, I will just have, I will have no sweets. I will have no uh, oil. I will have no fried things. You know, I just have, Lots of, of vegetables and, uh, you know, cereals and fruits and things like that, right? So if you are measuring or you're putting a number to that saying that I will use only a 2,000 calorie diet and I will do that. And the next thing you will say is I'll sleep well, right? If these are the three things, you'll say that I'll sleep for eight hours. So what happens is you you know which direction is you are going and then you have set these objectives very clearly and then for each of these objectives, you can set three key results and then start measuring these key results. So it's a very simple principle to follow. And if you start building that as a habit and do it for the next 90 days, you will automatically get there, which means you will lose five kilos. So here you do not complicate saying that, okay, I will I will do this, that, and other things. Just keep it very simple saying that if I do something consistently every day and measure what I'm doing and keep to that, you know, I will definitely get results. So... What is your most important objective? For example, if you set yourself in the next 90 days, some objective, whatever it may be, right? You can set that objective and then you can decide how you will measure whether you're moving, all the activities that you're doing is moving towards that objective or not, whether you're in the same direction or not. So in typically a customer in, in a business case, it would be a customer, it would be products and it would be operations. These are the three things which are important for business. So uh, let us take the example of uh, this tailoring business that we talked about. The objective is, let's say, to find if um, tailor on demand is a good business. If that is the objective, then what are the key results you will measure? So you will you will say that, okay, this in the next 90 days, I'm going to speak to 500 customers and I will see what is the feedback that they get. Then the product, then you talk about the product. You say that I want to design two products. One is we will stitch Salwar kameez and the other one is we'll stitch blouses. These are the two products that we will offer. Now, if you want to test this out, you will have to see how many of these products are coming. And then operations, you say that I will deliver everything in 24 hours or 48 hours and all of them will be perfect in the first delivery. So if the, these are the measured metrics, then you can put a number for that and you would say that 99% of all orders we will execute in 24 hours. So that becomes a metric. So when you set the objective and the key results, you know, the key results are numbers which you have to measure and the objective is something which doesn't have a number, but it has got a larger context. And that is what you are chasing. So I use objectives and key results to help people, you know, understand how they should spend their time and how should they should go from one stage to another. 
So typically I start with the founder, which means every founder has to agree to this objective. And then there is only one objective for a quarter. And then for every key result, you know, each founder is responsible for that. So if you are a single founder, you can start with one objective. And then for that one objective, you can have one or two key results and measure that every week. So when you do it alone, what happens is it becomes very boring. That's one of the reasons why you have to have mentors, advisors who can help you in doing that. Let's see if we can look at an example. So I'll take you, I'll take an example of another, another women oriented, uh, women uh, founder. So this company, you know, uh, builds technology, you know, for the jewelry industry, which means you can wear any jewelry virtually by using your mobile phone or a computer. So this was their, um, you know, this was their objective, which means dominate the augmented reality application in the jewelry market. And their key results were three. One was, you know, in the next 90 days, we have to deliver 150 lakhs of revenue. We need to ensure that whatever is there in the store, which means in the inside the jewelry um, shop and in the mobile or in the computer, they have to have the same platform and then cut burn rate to 20 lakhs a quarter, which means that we will not lose more than 20 lakhs a quarter because any technology company, which is, uh, you know, building technology and selling technology, there is a lot of time it takes for them to come to break even. So if you see this where, you know, this is tracked on a weekly basis, June 15, June 22nd, June 8th, every week these numbers are tracked. And this company was able to grow their business at least 100% quarter on quarter because they followed this technique and the entire organization started uh, working towards this. So this is the advantage of having, um, you know, uh, a system by which you can monitor and track what everybody is doing. So if you look at all the you know key factors for doing a startup one is you have to think big you have to start small and you have to scale fast and if you can't measure what you are doing you cannot improve it that's also very important for all of you to realize and it's always good to work in a framework there is no perfect system but if you follow some discipline in doing what you are doing you will always find the path shortest path to reach your vision so the vision is very important the leap of faith assumption is very important the minimum viable product is uh, very important and then whatever you are doing in terms of the experiments and the learnings that you have got, that's what we call as the validated learning. That's very important. With the validated learning, what you do is you change your experiments and then again, build measure loop. You get into the build measure loop, which means iterative process you do. And that is when you are able to understand whether you should persevere what you are doing or you should change from what you are doing to something else. So you, you, you started this process of um, you know, trying to find out if women want tailors uh, on demand and then you suddenly speak to a few men they say that no we want right and then the whole business changes from a woman to a man and then you see that that business has totally transformed your original business model so see there are other things which are um, you know which are very what should i say very very important but i really i'm not able to understand at what stage most of the participants are here because a, what is meant for you uh, when you are at a particular stage may not appeal to you when you are in a different stage or even if you are not doing a startup, many of these things may not uh, help you. So I, you know, I would once again request uh, most, you know, all the people who are present, please start interacting because without interaction, you know, it becomes very boring. So if you can tell me what you are doing and what is the challenge you are facing, I may be able to help you and others may be able to learn in that process. So can we see some? action from your side please anyone wants to share hello sanu shweta yes rinku go ahead rinku you need to unmute hello sir so i'm hello, into hello. zero oil cooking i'm doing uh -huh. uh, i'm running my cloud kitchen from home so like okay. i cook everything without oil I'm facing a okay. uh, problem in expanding my business, mm -hmm. growing my business. So are you getting too many orders that you are not able to deliver or is no, it that I'm you not need getting, more orders? I need more orders. I'm not able to okay. reach out to people uh, properly. Okay. See, in a single uh, kitchen, 
a type of an environment where you are a home worker, you know, you are doing this business from home. The word of mouth is very, very important, which means, um, you know, you, who is your customer? You have to ask yourself, who is your customer? So your customers are typically people who are very health conscious or who are having a health problem because of which they cannot take oil or people who are wanting to reduce weight, right? So this could be your customer base. So do who do you think are your customers? Like uh, till now, my customers were young people also. Like all age groups I had customers till now. See, this is the problem. You know, all age groups can use your product, but which is the significant group which will continuously so health, come back to you? Health conscious people. Those who actually so when need... You say, uh, yeah, when you say health conscious people, you know, it could again mean many things, right? So what do you mean by health conscious people? People who have a, a, a disease or people who want to be very fit or people who are athletic? <coughs> people what who have been restricted to eat oil. Okay. They can have oil. Yeah. So anybody who has got a problem by consuming oil, they are all your customers. Yeah. So they are your primary customers, which means you have to eat, but you cannot have food with oil, right? They are your primary customers. Where will you find these customers? Uh, those who have some problems like heart problems or diabetic or... Yeah, so where will you find these customers? How will you know that, you know, this is a place where you can get many customers? Hospitals or gym. Hospitals or... See... See, hospital gyms are all, you know, out of reach for single individuals, right? So you, yeah. you can go to a hospital. They say, no, 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 we will not allow you to talk to our patients. Then what will you do? I think each house has one of the other patient like this. Each house only. Yes. So, so the most important thing for you to understand is you have to be able to get a word of mouth type of a publicity where you know where there is let's say there are three four patients right and you you are able to identify these patients and then you are giving them food and this food becomes a medicine for them which means they are becoming better and that word of mouth is what will take your business to a very different level because these are people who have actually experienced that your food is medicine right and they are the people who will tell others so the most important thing is your product has to really succeed which means the product has to speak so if you say so again if you look at a disease for example if you can cook food by which a person can lose five kilos right in let's say one month's time right you will have people lining up your house outside your house saying that okay one month i will want i want to lose five kilos you know tell me how much i have to pay right so there what happens is people have got a pain and they are willing to do that so your product also has to be very customized in such a way that it is able to talk on its own, right? So without that, what happens is you are going all over and you are asking people, you know, somebody places an order once and then he doesn't come back, you know, then for every single order, you have to struggle, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a part of the growth process. But once you discover that, you know, if you are able to do this, then people are, you know, queuing outside your house for your meal. That is when your mm -hmm. product, uh, you know, product has received market fit. That's what we call as product market fit. So it's very important for you to review what is actually working for you. So whatever is working for you, start scaling that up. So if you if you today are serving, let's say, 20 meals a day, find out out of these 20 meals, what is the commonality of all these customers? If there are 20 customers who are placing orders today, you know, what is it that you can identify in these 20 customers, which is very common so that the moment you go to a, a place where there are many such people, for example, it could be a camp or it could be a, a big a cardiologist who is coming and giving a lecture. So everybody who has got something with the heart, you know, is coming to listen to that place. At that time, is there a way by which you can distribute pamphlets and get your message across? Because you can't do it by advertising. Because today, if you advertise also, mm -hmm. it will all go waste. So you really need to find that product which is actually very attractive to customers. And that is what is the, is the, is the toughest part of any business. And that's what we call as discovering your business model. So I'm telling you, if you can build a, you know, a menu which has got both variety at the same time, uh, health, um, uh, what should I say, orientation, where I would lose five mm. kilos, you will see so many people are signing up as a subscription service. Right. Because there's a big market for that. 
Huh? Right. Right. So if you work on that, see, it's it's not easy yeah. to crack that, right? It because you, yeah. you you really need to work on the product in terms of saying that okay, this is tasty at the same time very healthy and people are losing weight, right? So for you to discover that menu or build mm-hmm. that menu, test it, that's when you can really get product market fit. Exactly, because I I make products which are tasty and like with special menu, but I'm not able to design that my products in the proper way. Like you said, one month they can lose weight. So this sounds good that if i can prepare a menu like that because i have varieties but i'm not able to and then what happens is others start telling you know for example i if i uh-huh. sign up and i lose 5 kilos i tell my friends yaar you know uh-huh. unke sath sign up karo ek mahina mein 5 kilo to guaranteed hai because people pay 50000 20000 for every kilo uh-huh. of weight they lose right mm-hmm. if you see you know people are spending mm-hmm. so much of money in losing weight right so that money can come right. to you straight away right. so if you can shed One one uh, thousand kgs in one month, right? You are looking mm-hmm. at a few crores of revenue. Right. So it's a great business. I work on it. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. So so your business has to go by word of mouth because it's very specialized and the customer segment is very different. Mm-hmm. So word of mouth is the best publicity for you. If you spend even mm-hmm. you know ten lakhs in advertising. you will not get returns on that for this business okay. so this design of the product you know which will actually solve the problem that is your core competence that is what you really need to crack once you crack that automatically a lot of things will fall in place right okay anyone else thank you, thank you. So there is somebody who's asking for the finance financial model. Ayush is Ayush here around? Uh, could you please explain the financial modeling? It will be very useful. Yeah, I can do that. But uh, before I go there, I just wanted to see if there are any other entrepreneurs here who are trying to, you know, get their product into the market or trying struggling with, you know, getting customers. If there are people, I would love to, you know. Uh, answer some of their queries or some what they are doing right and wrong. Anyone dance there? Yeah. Hello, sir. Yeah. Um. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. I am into business of plantable paper hampers made out of plantable papers, which is the uh, basically for the corporate sector. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a gifting uh, hampers. Uh, made out of plantable papers which is completely eco friendly and nothing of uh, any of the products is not a waste even the box of the hamper you can plant it so uh, it is completely eco friendly uh, with the motto use and grow not use and throw but uh, the problem here again is uh, reaching out to the corporate it's becoming a very difficult task for me uh, especially in a place where i stay I mean, it's a small town, so yeah, we don't have big corporates or anywhere so, you know, where I can go and reach them personally. So that is becoming a problem that I am not getting enough customers and enough orders. So it's like a once in a while thing for me. How can I? So this? these products, do you make it yourself? Do you make these no. products yourself? No, no, no. I procure it from someone. and then i okay. um, forward it that's it so why should somebody buy from you i mean it's not reachable from where i am getting everyone can't reach that person that uh, factory but, from where i'm procuring okay no but in case that factory advertises tomorrow that come and buy from us then you will be eliminated is that right yeah Yeah, yeah, definitely. That is the big problem of competition, because now after I started, I've seen in many of the online platforms, I've seen plantable products coming up. So now this is becoming very difficult for me to stay in this business for long. I don't know how to uh, carry forward. Uh, this. So, so this is this is the market forces, right? So until unless you have a competitive advantage. it is very difficult for you to survive in a market where you do not have uh, something which can protect you from all these market forces right 
So for example, if you're signed up with this company saying that you have to give it to me exclusively for three years, right? And in that three years, you're aggressively marketing and establishing your presence. Then what happens is even if tomorrow they say that, no, the exclusivity is over, we want to go to somebody else. You already have created a market, which means everybody knows you and everybody will start buying from you, right? So without that competitive advantage, what happens is you just get, you're just waiting for somebody to, you know, sort of ring the bell and place an order. And that way the business cannot grow, right? So you have two options. One is, you know, get out of this business, do something different where you can have, you can apply all the learnings that you have had. Or if you want to stay in this business, you know, build a competitive advantage and, uh, you know, try to see how you can reach more and more customers with something, some message instead of business. Is it possible for you to go to schools? Is, is it possible for you to, you know, go take it to a consumer? Right. If you can take it to a consumer, then there are millions of people to whom you can, uh, you know, position the product. If you're taking it to corporate, corporates are always spoiled for choice, which means uh, there are so many people who are offering them deals all the time. Right. It becomes very difficult to compete in, in the corporate, uh, you know, landscape. Right. So you may have to look at a different customer segment who are very conscious about nature, who are conscious about the environment and who only want to who support such activities, right? There are many people, instead of giving something made out of plastic or, you know, something which is molded, they prefer to give natural things. So they are your customer base. They are the people who actually appreciate and understand what you're doing. So maybe you have to look at a different customer segment also. But it will take time because these type of things, you know, it takes a long time for this to get into the people's mind. You know, people uh, say many things, but they don't do what they say, right? Because it's not priority for them. What is priority for them is, you know, to give a gift which the other person will like, you know, they don't care about the environment at that time. But there are very few people who are very sensitive to the environment and planting trees. So they are your customers. I so, have so you really uh, need to rework on your business. Yeah. I have tried individual customers too. But the thing is, these type of products are a bit on the costlier side. So, I mean, uh, normal customers will never approach Again, once they bought the product, but uh, it's again that footfall, it won't be uh, repeated footfall. The thing is that. Right. So your customer acquisition doesn't pay off because they don't place repeat orders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, the thing is, it is costly. I mean, everyone can't afford these type of gifts. So might be what you said that I have to think to change my business. Now I think I have to think over it because uh, yeah, this but is not when working. you're changing your business please ensure that yeah please ensure that all the things that you have learned you know in this business you don't make the same mistakes again in the new business because there's nothing wrong see you don't have much stake on the ground in terms of you know having invested in a plant and machinery and doing all these things you're just buying from somebody else and you're selling it right so you're you are typically building a brand Right. So when we when we when we buy products from others and people buy from us, we say that we are building a brand. So people buy from brands. So if you can build yourself as a brand, then any product that you build, bring in, you know, people will buy it because they buy the brand. They don't buy the product. Yeah. yeah. So you have to look look at that also, which means increase the number of SKUs that you have. You know, where people would recognize that this is a very um, sensitive brand, you know, which which looks at the environment, which uh, you know is working towards the United Nations Sustainable Goals, you know, so that becomes your positioning statement at that time that you know this brand is very conscious about the environment, so we must buy from them. So it may be this, it may be something else, so it could be a small solar torch, anything, you know, it could be any product which is like you know helping the sustainability costs. So you can look at branding yourself like that. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else has got anything? Okay, so I'll quickly um, take you sir, to... Can I ask one question, sir? Sure, 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 please. Go ahead. Sir, as you said, I should make a menu of one month for reducing, uh, like, this much calorie will reduce your weight. So for that, that can have to be associated with uh, some nutrient or something like that to make absolutely a absolutely because 
yes absolutely because uh, you know uh, you your speciality is cooking without oil right yeah no yeah. cooking without oil you know if you want it to become a viable business then you must get customers who are willing to pay for that and who have a need right. for that right? right so in order to uh, for you to be uh, credible people will say okay uh, are you are asking me to sign up let's say for one week i have to pay let's say 2000 rupees that's that's the cost of all the meals that you are delivering so i'll take yeah. a subscription for one week and see you know whether it's really helping me or not and then i will start renewing my subscription every week right in that case right. every single product that you are delivering you know has to explain why this is important for you to eat and what is the calorific mm-hmm. value and how this food helps you in terms of you know let's say absorption of fat or absorption of mm-hmm. you know anything right so depending mm-hmm. on the body constitution you know you can say that these are the types of food that you must have so that your weight comes down so that you require right. a nutritionist yeah. and probably uh, mm-hmm. consulting a, a doctor also who can help you in terms of uh, you know yeah. giving you references or you know that people can consult a doctor in case they are allergic to certain yeah. things right so you require see that's where the team comes you know you require specialization yeah. so if if there is a good nutritionist who is working with you or who is helping you do mm-hmm. this your product yeah. becomes much sharper right first person to person it will differ yes yes so you can say that you have to do diagnostic with us which means you know you have to answer questions or you have to do a test or you you know you type with a diagnostic center they will do a mm-hmm. test and they will you know those numbers are there and based on those numbers you are yeah. customizing the menu for them for example if somebody has got sugar somebody has got bp somebody has got this that or you know body fat percentage bmi so mm-hmm. many parameters are there which you can use to uh, you know mm-hmm. build the menu for that particular person and this would all be driven by technology right so if you take any field there is so much to do in that field right thank you for your suggestion welcome welcome anyone else otherwise i'll just go to my last portion which is to look at financial models so why are we talking about all these things it was basically about you know how do you pitch and how do you uh, look at investors you know why investors should invest in your business this was i think the core uh, you know topic of this discussion is why is it that investors invest in some businesses but they don't care about your business right so it is very important for you to understand that an investor is putting his money so that he can multiply his money through you so if i am putting let's say 10 lakhs in some business i would expect this money to grow to 1 crore in some time so for 10 lakhs if i take let's say 5% of the company in the sense which means i am a 5% shareholder in that company and now if this 10 lakhs has to become 1 crore which means it has to multiply 10 times now the 95% that you hold has also got to multiply by 10 times which means the uh, the 10 lakhs and the nine, so 9.5 crore should be the value of what you are um, holding right at this point of time for example if i get 5 uh, if i get uh, 5% for 10 lakhs which means your business is valued at 5 into 20 no sorry 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 so if you if if i am putting in 10 lakhs and i am getting 5% of a company your business is valued at 200 lakhs so it is 10 over 200 that's the type of um, uh, you know percentage that i am getting now if i have to make this 10 lakhs to 1 crore which means there has to be a 10 times multiple so your 2 lakhs has to 2 crores has to become 20 crores so if your business has to become 20 crores that's when i will get a multiple so the most important thing which all investors see is is this business scalable is this business going to give me 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 times return on my investment if it is not going to do that you know then this business is not worth investing because you cannot um, you know multiply your money in businesses which do not grow to large numbers so that is one of the first fundamental reasons why most of you feel that you know investors are not interested in your business because you have not thought about the investors problem the investors problem is he want to in, what to invest in businesses which can grow 100 times 1000 times in 3 to 7 years or maybe more right so that is one of the reasons why investors who are not known to you or who are professional investors do not invest in many of the businesses because you have not think uh, thought through why an investor should come to you 
So running out of money is one of the top reasons why startups fail. So if you if you look at a hundred startups which have failed, you will see that ninety five of them have failed because they did not have any money. So any any startup is uh, you know subject to this risk, and only if you get money at the right time and you are able to use the money rightly and you are able to scale your business rightly, you get more and more funding. Otherwise, you don't get funding at all. So you have to work with your your own um, money, and that's. That's uh, that's always got a limitation when you have to do business with your own money. So let us look at, you know, what are the things that we need to understand from a financial model. Can you see my screen, or I think I'll stop and share again. Okay. So this is just give you an idea. of financial modeling when we talk about financial modeling it's all about assumptions and how you are looking at this assumption and what is it that you are going to make over a period of time so models are developed based on assumptions and to give an indication of the financial needs and outcomes of a startup over a period of time so this is a star- hypothetical startup which is a d2c startup for men special skin for example we are assuming that there is a startup which is making something for skin care for men which means once a man shaves he can put this cream uh, and you know it's going to take care of his skin in the face so the revenue assumptions are here for example the assumption is i am going to sell to 5000 customers in the first year second year i am going to sell to 50000 and third year i am going to sell to 2 lakh so there is only an assumption so this is not true and i am assuming the average order value to be 300 rupees for every customer so what happens is i also look at repeat orders which means somebody who's bought once is going to place more orders and there are some people who are going to return my product which means 5% are going to return the product and i will have to give a discount in order to attract people to buy this and then i will have to pay a 2% for payment processing which means online if somebody is paying an order uh, placing an order and paying 2% is deducted by the payment processor so when you look at this as the assumptions then what happens is you are looking at a sales of 15 lakhs of rupees in the first year and the repeat sales is you know 12% so it's 1 lakh 80000 rupees you are looking at 5% of goods being returned which means it's minus 75000 rupees the payment processor takes 2% of 15 lakhs and uh, you know this so this becomes 33600 and then you have discounts you are giving discount of 10% so the net revenue comes to 14.21 lakhs in the first year now you are also assuming what is the cost of goods sold which means raw material is 25% manufacturing is 10% packaging 2% fulfillment is 3% and then customer service is 2% when we say fulfillment it's basically the delivery cost so if you see all these things and put together you see that your cost of goods sold is 6.3 lakhs for this whole thing so your gross margin is 56% so the same way it is computed for 3 years which means all of them are assumptions they are actually not the real figures they are assumptions based on you know all the facts that i have found out now if you look at this sheet these are your operating expenses which means you have to spend 18 lakhs on marketing you have to spend 46 lakhs on manpower administration rent rates and taxes it and website audit and compliance contingency so the operating expenses in the first year is 81 lakhs so what has happened is your revenue is 14.21 lakhs your cost of goods sold is 6 lakh 30000 but your operating expenses is 81 lakhs so your net margin is 73 lakhs in the first year is this making sense to all of you so in the first year when you are introducing a product you cannot get that much of volume in sales though you are advertising right and so you are ending up with a loss of 73 lakhs now second year what happens is again if you look at the assumptions we are looking at a 5000 to become 50000 so in 50000 also you know if you load all these costs for each year you will see that you are making a loss of 96 lakhs and in the third year when you are selling to 2 lakh customers and all these assumptions are put together that's when you are making a profit of 42.3 lakhs now typically what investors do is they look at this model and if they like this model they know that the 73 lakhs and 96 lakhs has to be funded to you because you are losing this money but you're in the third year your business has become very robust and you have uh, you know you have a top line of 4 crore 84 lakhs and you know when you project it further you know this 
become a 40 50 crore business and the investor actually looks at how he would exit the business and this is your human resource cost if you want to do a skincare brand you have founder salary you have r and d you have sales and marketing you have production accounting customer support all these things so all these things cost money so typically investors would fund all these things and wait for you to uh, see you know how you can grow the business so if you look at year wise you have zero cash you are raising 1 crore of funds your annual expenditure is 87 lakhs and your revenue is 14 lakhs so you are burning 73 lakhs and you have a closing balance of 26 lakhs the same thing when you project it year wise your sales is growing and net your burn becomes negative and you have you are left with this much of money at the end of 5 years so so this is why investors will keep funding you till you reach this number so that's why when you know you hear that okay this company has made so much of loss still they are getting funded and their valuation is becoming billions of dollars you have to understand that they have a strong financial model because of which you know if they are actually getting the funding and uh, those funding are continuously being consumed and more and more funding is coming so this is this type of a financial model you need to make for any business if you really want to test your assumptions and if you want to understand how much money you require to go from stage a to stage b so this is all about you know this is a very simple exercise of financial modeling but your business will be very different so it will require different assumptions and different data so i wanted to tell you that you know it's it's a very uh, you know from the outside it looks very easy but when you go deep you know there are so many parameters so many things that you need to take care that it becomes a handful and founders are always um, you know struggling to put all of them together and to make it work so if you really want to do a structured approach then you need to follow all these things and you you have to continuously look at data and your experience and tune your business model accordingly i hope i've been able to uh, you know share some of my learnings with all of you i'm more than happy to take more questions on this so any questions guys hello anybody questions so uh, in fact, I will ask when when we are wanting to pitch and when we want to present the ideas, what are the key factors that we should keep in mind? See, the most important thing is you should talk about your problem, your solution, and the problem that you're addressing. Instead of talking about the world, you better talk about what what you have done, what you have learned. You know, I typically tell um, entrepreneurs that you know. Everybody knows everything about what's happening in the world, but you talk about your experience, which is very unique. The first two second, uh, first two minutes that you talk, you know, if you talk something which you have experienced, and that it becomes very important, and that is when investors start listening to you, you know, very deeply, and then they understand what is your business model. So instead of trying to find, you know, uh, from Google, what are the things you can figure out and paste, and uh, you know, create a presentation, you know, talk about your own experience. Talk about why you are passionate about solving a problem these are these are the type of things which actually makes a difference and helps you also because you are not talking about something else you're talking about how you have seen a problem and what have you done to solve that problem or what are you planning to do to solve that problem so that becomes very important when you present to investors investors look at you and they know that okay you mean business you are seriously talking about a problem and you're talking about what you have done to solve the problem or how you are going to solve the problem. That's when the interest is sustained. But if you talk about the problem that, okay, India is a very poor country, we've got 50 crore people who don't get to eat, you know, it doesn't interest the investor. He's, he's trying to find out what is it that you have by which, you know, there could be a huge growth or a huge opportunity that can be created. So that's one. And you must get your financial models right. That's very important. You must know why you want the money that you're asking for. So most people say that, oh, how much do you want to raise? I want to raise, you know, $1 million. Now we ask them, okay, what will you do with $1 million? They don't have an answer. They'll say, oh, we'll spend it in marketing. Are you, you're not supposed to spend money in marketing until the marketing money comes back to you in the form of sales and margins, right? So most people are just going by here, say that, okay, we will raise $10 million, $5 million, but actually they may not need that money or they may not be able to use that money also. So the money that you require, whether it's yours or somebody else's, you really need to understand 
why you need that money and what will you do with that money because sit, money sitting in a bank is not good for anybody money has to be deployed so that it can grow so it may grow in 5 years time it may grow in 10 years time but it has to grow or at least it it has to show the potential that it can grow so it's very important for you to get your financials right financial models right and you you must be able to articulate that to an investor so that the investor can come forward to support you so pitching is a very very important thing because that's when you strike a chord with the investor and if you can pitch properly even if your business model is fully not discovered you know investors will support you because they can see that thing in you that you are actually chasing a model and that model is actually going to help them scale help you scale and get a large piece of the market i hope i have answered this question yes. um if okay so does anybody else has questions otherwise i can keep asking questions because i myself end up having so many questions on what i want to do and how i want to do it so and i always take these opportunities to ask questions so uh, my next is does anybody has question or any clarification that you need you know the question doesn't means that you know it has to be a, pro a proper question it has to come like a from formatted village uh, you know syllabus kind of a stuff it's not that if you have any query you want any opinion on something please feel free to you know open your mic and ask Uh, am I audible? Yes. Sir? Yes. Yeah. So I'm extremely sorry. I uh, just realized that this the session was supposed to be only for women. I'm actually proud that I could get an opportunity to still ask the question. I hope that's not an issue. Not at all. Please go okay. ahead. Okay. Uh, so we are into uh, exports of uh, industrial products. Uh, we export to over 25 countries. Uh, we make uh, drainage casting products like manual cover. Basically, our products are used in infrastructure and uh, civil civil infrastructure across the world. so currently our major exports are to the middle east and european markets people that we now sell to are actually buying from us these are people who are like importers and then they are selling to municipalities or the construction companies in their home countries uh, last so we've been exporting this for last 4 years our export volumes are about 4 and a half 5 million dollars a year uh, besides the domestic business so now what we experimented in the last 6 months is that instead of selling to importers in the foreign countries can i reach out to the end consumers in those markets so we started with one country in the middle east that is qatar we had a small local presence there created a small rental warehouse uh, just used it uh, of somebody we didn't buy a separate warehouse we just had a space somebody in a network you know kind of found out that you know we can share a space we kept our own materials and started selling to the local contractors suddenly our margins doubled suddenly we realized that customers are actually interested in dealing with manufacturers directly this industry is largely dominated by very few large mncs you know companies are doing about 40 45 billion dollar of business across various countries so there are few american brands and few german brands who are actually having a local presence in each of the market you know wherever this these products are sold that is pretty much all over the world and they have their local presence from which uh, they sell out the products so now instead of being reliant on these two three four big names we are trying to give these big names a run for their money by kind of being in the local market and trying to compete against them the advantage that we have is that our designs are more quicker you know these guys are elephants right so it takes time for them to design better products and you know listen to their customer and you know kind of change their product lines and uh, so, so what we are now trying to do is that we are trying to raise private equity uh, we believe that 5 million dollars can go up to 50 million dollars we have a network of people who are willing to support us there are people in the european market who we have been working with and they are working at these companies and they want to jump board and you know even they want to come with us and kind of help us uh, cater to the local market that they understand the local language they understand how the business works in their country and the same goes for uh, the middle eastern countries where we believe we can have a local presence and do a lot of business so we will start with the civil infrastructure products which are manhole covers and gratings and all these products and later on we want to add some other building materials also which we believe there is a there is a big gap in terms of quality price it's a slightly unorganized market and there is a space that we can organize it to create an umbrella brand of products mostly catering to the building material industry so so i just from you i just want to kind of you know get your advice on how should i go about raising private equity for, because this is not a typical internet business or a consumer business that i can approach a startup you know like a venture capitalist or like you know those kind of guys so this is probably somebody who has a family office somebody who's from a manufacturing background probably would understand a business like this so just your preliminary thoughts on something like this sir 
see uh, as long as it's a global business and it can be scaled and it's got significant margins i don't see any reason why you know you cannot raise money because investors are all of all types you know there are people who invest in movies there are people who invest in healthcare there are people who invest in food business there are people who invest in women so there are people there are private equity funds or there are venture capitalists there are hedge funds there are various types of investors who invest in your type of business so the first thing you need to understand is do your research and find out who are the investors who invest in this space which means hardcore engineering molding these type of things it could be a large company itself you know who have uh, allied uh, uh, you know areas of work who have got uh, uh, a investment arm that company can invest in you so i don't see any reason why you cannot uh, get investment you really need to understand and find out what is the type of investor who is good for you once you decide that even if there are 10 people in the world you will see that reaching out to these 10 people will give you a much more clarity and you will be able to come come back with something which is very solid so i would say that you can your business is investable you need to just find out who are the investors in this space and once you find that out you will see that a lot of things are moving faster for you than what it is at this point of time thank you sir thank you so much good evening sir uh, yeah shweta here after a long days yes. uh, i'm seeing you over this platform actually i don't think that you remember uh, that we met uh, at uh, south city mall regarding some logistics okay. uh, startup that time you told me that uh, you were you were already invested some kogo logistics of some sort of that i don't remember kogo yes kogo yes yes kogo yes, yes. yes you remember that we met regarding a lady yes, project yes yes how yes, are you yes. sir i'm fine thank you so how is your project doing as uh, my project is doing well we have uh, earned revenue we have still now till this march 31st we have generated 3 3 share so very good very good yeah but now we are also developing our tech platform for e-commerce uh, e tech driven e platform for fine jewelry so that is into fine jewelry uh, okay yeah i told you that time also that we will be coming up very soon so because we are developing such things so at this so because of the pandemic i stopped actually because that time everyone was struggling for the survival so that was not the right time so post pandemic i again restarted the reinitiated that venture so that now on that particular venture we are into prototype stage at this moment and we are negotiating with our two tech partners and we are developing our platform on microsoft azure basic platform so on the azure platform then we are going to add some uh, some new features on a new tech tools also over there so we are now looking for some seed investment so can you please advise said that how we should move forward and where i should approach so you send your deck to me i'll take a look at your sure. deck and sure. i'll see if i can uh, you know pass you on to you know the type of investors who would be interested sure. but it will be and tough but the... your space is very competitive now very very competitive sir and if i don't do yes. now there is not probably i won't get the right platform and right time also yes yeah, yeah. so uh, sir i will apply send... for this uh, women pitch competition as well i know i know i have already applied to that global pitch yes. competition for tai yeah yeah because sir uh, in this frame period now i have got opportunity and i have got rewarded for a goldman sachs scholarship also from i am bangalore okay so i yeah. have done that uh, entrepreneurial program as well and i got selected as a top 10 women entrepreneur also by women entrepreneur magazine this year so now congratulations <laughs> thank you thank you sir mane uh, it's really pleasure for me to connect you once more out this uh, and thanks to rachna and neha actually to take me forward through this platform so sir i will definitely share my deck through linkedin messenger where i um, mane in the meantime i have already connected with you over there so i'll share with you just after this call sure. i'll share with you Sure, sure. And thanks, Rachna. Okay. I have applied. Let me see how far I can go through. Uh, it's 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 just the conviction that can take you far. Believe yeah, in yourself yeah. and believe in the product. You will go through. Absolutely, absolutely. I do believe so. Let's see. I'm yeah. crossing my fingers. Yeah. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, sir. Yeah. Sir, I have one more question, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, sir, you talk. You spoke about finance, sir, like investment. So, like in my case, like we are homemakers, so we don't have a like a fixed uh, income, monthly income. So we face problem like I need to keep a staff, uh, helping uh, to create my infrastructure. For that, I need money. Because I cannot, uh, I fixed expenses currently uh, party because my fixed income nahi. So I face drawback in that uh, area. So what should I like? Should the should, should we go for finance? I mean, what we can do for it? See, I would say at this point of time, don't borrow money. You know, from institutions, you should look at family and friends to take some small support. At this point of time, see, um, they they are people who understand. They, they are people who know you and they are not expecting for a, you know, they're not an investor that they're looking for a big return from you. So they are the people who can really help you at this point of time. But whatever you take, you must be able to move to the next stage very quickly where professional investors or institutions can come and give you money. So there are today various uh, schemes by which people who want to do something can get investments, right? So you once you get to a particular stage, then you all these things open up for you. So it's not very difficult to, you know, do something with friends and families, money, and then scale it so that you can get other types of funding. Thank you. Any more questions, guys? Okay. So I have one question. How do we validate our financial models? See, financial model is full of assumptions. So when you start working, yes. that is when you start getting actual data. So the actual data can be much lower than what you have, you know, what you have projected, or it could be equal or higher, right? So that's what will make you understand whether your financial model is right or not. So financial model includes number of customers, average customer value, you know, margins, cost, all these type of things it includes. So based on whether your assumptions are correct or not, you know, that is what is getting tested and you're discovering your business model. So that is a continuous process and you cannot burn too much money to get there. So you have to do it in small, uh, you know, experiments and see whether it works or not. So getting the price right is very important. If you have a product and you want to price it, Right, you have to know that this price is affordable by a large number of customers, or people don't mind uh, mind paying this type of a price for this uh, for your solution. So those are very very important things. Okay, thank you. So I, I will leave my uh, email ID in the chat box. So if anybody wants to, you know, has any questions or would like some. You know, I'm not an expert in anything, but I just talk to people. I work with very successful entrepreneurs, help them. So that's why I know probably know a little more than many other people because I passionately follow how business models work. So you can contact me and I'll try to do my best. Sir, your advice means a lot and it helps a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So guys, if there is no more questions, um, are we good to go in that case? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank Alex. you. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you so thank you, sir. much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so thank much you. for the session, I would say. I think thank it was you, so sir. much of an eyesight for me as well, because as you know, I had shared my business plan. It is coming. It is going to go ahead. Though I'm going to bootstrap that entire company uh, by myself. I'm not borrowing. I'm investing my own money in this space. So yeah, let's see how it goes ahead. Okay. All the best. Yeah, but I am I'm, I'm still reviewing on the financial model of that same uh, space. So yeah. So today today I have given a term sheet to one coffee uh, you know <clears throat> company in Bombay. Okay. So okay. their products are extremely good, and uh, you know I like okay. their products. So. Okay. Okay. So thank you very I much. I have two three I have two three more things coming up, but I will definitely connect mm -hmm. back with you. This week was a little sure. tied up with me for my assignments. But I will definitely okay. come back to you on that. Okay. Good luck, Rashtina. Okay.
थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच श्वेता थैंक यू एवरीबॉडी थैंक यू सो मच हरि सर बाय बाय थैंक यू थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सो मच यस थैंक यू रचना थैंक यू सर थैंक यू रचना आई गेस दिस इज आवर लास्ट क्लास राइट दिस इज द लास्ट क्लास नेहा नेहा आई विल बी सेंडिंग अक्रॉस फ्यू ईमेल्स राइट अप्स ओके जो हमारा डेक रेडी हो गया है अगर तो हम उसको ईमेल्स लिखेंगे मैं आज रात तक तुमको कुछ कमेंट्स भेजती हूँ एंड प्रोबेबली देन वी सेंड दोज ई मेल्स और राइट ठीक है चल रहे रचना वी आर नॉट एबल टू फिल दैट पिच का फॉर्म डोंट वरी आई थिंक वी विल डू वन डे हु इज वॉन्टिंग टू फिल द पिच का एक मिनट एक काम करो लेट दिस वीक गो बाय नेक्स्ट वीक में हमारा एक शेड्यूल क्यू एन ए क्लास था राइट नेहा तो उस क्लास पे शेड्यूल कर दो दैट इफ यू हैव एनी ट्रबल फिलिंग इन योर पिच कॉम्पिटिशन फाइल और वट एवर वट एवर क्यू एन ए इज देर आप उस दिन आ सकते हो लेट दम बी देर दैट डे ठीक है चलो बाय 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 बाय